and welcome to Delta Live. I'm here today with James Nestor, author of a provocative new book, Breath. James, welcome to Nilda Live. Thanks a lot for having me. I'm so glad you came. Um, I've got your book here. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit of a story here. I um, was listening to another podcast and I heard you and I was like, who is this? You know, listening to what you were talking about. And I pulled over, bought your book. <laughs> Put the audio book on real fast, kept going, pulled back over again, sent it to a staff member and one of my team. And I said, hey, who is this? We've got to have we've got to have James on. I said, can you get him for us? And so I just want you to know I was so moved uh, by breath that I I just thank you for coming, really. Um, oh, thanks. <laughs> thanks for having me. I'm glad you didn't get in an accident or something. You know, that's a scary story there, but it all worked out well. No, no, no. It's Texas driving, you know. So anyway, but, but I, I got, you know, so many different books are on, you know, meditation, yoga, breathing, taking deep breaths, all these different things. But your book is so very different. Um, and it's challenged really so many different things that I thought about breathing or even knew about breathing. So you actually say that people are breathing wrong. How is that possible? I mean, we've all been breathing since we were born, right? Yeah. I've okay. been breathing my whole life, luck luckily, uh, <laughs> as have you. But uh, when I first heard the statement from researchers in the field, I said, what are you talking about? And then they showed me the data. If you look at all of these chronic diseases that we have in the States and all over the world, snoring, sleep apnea, asthma, autoimmune problems, I mean, on and on and on. So many of those problems can either be exacerbated by or caused by improper breathing. And the scientists told me that from 80 to 90% of us have some sort of breathing dysfunction, which again, seems nuts. But these are people who have been studying this stuff for decades. But it's, as they say, is an autonomic nervous thing. How, it seems like it would just be so natural. How did you even get into this topic? Well, I never intended to go out and write a book about breathing. That was the, the last thing on my mind. <laughs> but I kept accumulating strange stories, strange experiences, strange data, strange studies. And finally, after years and years of playing around with this idea, I had my file cabinet was large enough that I said, hmm, maybe there's something in here. And I think the, the real turning point for me was to hear all these claims over the years, to have my own experiences with breathing that my doctor couldn't explain, my, a pulmonologist couldn't explain, and then to see free divers, these people who have trained themselves into the art of breathing so well that they can hold their breath for eight, nine minutes at a time. They can do these things that we have been told are absolutely impossible, but they do them every day. And I thought, wow, if breathing can allow us to do that, where else can it take us? And that's what I spent several years researching. So we're going to get into some of the mechanics of breathing problems, how to fix them and, and those kind of things. But let's give the audience a little bit more sense of what's at stake here. What are, and I know there are many, but what are the downsides of bad breathing? Just look around. I mean, that, that's all you need to do. Uh, breathing improperly when you're young will change the skeletature of your face. It will change how you look. It will change your airways. And those things, any sort of resistance in the airway, you don't even need to snore or have sleep apnea to suffer from chronic neurological problems, physical problems, mental health issues. I mean, I could not believe that so much of this science had been done over the decades and people weren't really talking about this. They are in, in academic institutions. They've been talking about it. They've been collecting studies. They've been doing the work. But the rest of us, we tend to try to fix the separate little things that are wrong in our bodies without looking at the core issue. And the core issue to so many of these things is breathing. So what then, just on the converse, I mean, what, what are the upsides of breathing correctly? You name it again, whether you're an athlete and there's been various studies looking at athletes who have focused on their breathing and gone on to win world records that that's been going on for 50 years for, especially with people with chronic maladies, um, all the stuff that everyone has nowadays, allergies, asthma, even autoimmune problems, these issues 
So many of them can be tied or again, as I said, exacerbated by poor breathing habits. And when you fix the poor breathing, the body is allowed to then heal itself. And these stories, again, seem outrageous, but the science is so clear. And these people are out there, and I talked to dozens of them, who had had asthma for 30, 40 years and learned how to breathe in a different way, specifically not breathe from their mouth and breathe slowly and breathe less, were able to really get those symptoms of that disease in control. And that's, it's very, the science is very clear on this. All right, so let's get into some of the causes of bad breathing. You say animals breathe well, and we don't even breathe as well as we did a few centuries ago, which is that, okay, how did we get this way? So tell us about that and what the evidence is for it. So several years ago, I was put in contact with some biological anthropologists. There is such a thing, and they're out there, and they do amazing work. And they told me that the human skull, specifically the mouth, the front of the face has been shrinking. And so evolution is constant, right? We, we don't stop it. We're never sitting in one place for too long. But this change has happened so quickly, and it really started booting up around 400 years ago, the advent of industrialized foods. So I didn't believe this because I'd never heard of this until I went and looked at about a hundred ancient skulls. And I tell you, it was one of the creepiest things to be in this museum, to be downstairs surrounded by skulls. They're all looking back at us with perfectly straight teeth, with these extremely powerful jaws, with these forward growing faces. And these researchers have been measuring these skulls and finding that 99% of them have this very powerful forward growing face and 90% of us are growing in the opposite direction. Wow. Okay. So what does that have to do with diet and how it affects the breathing? So what they found, um, and this has been studied for at least 70 years, is that softer food does not require very much chewing to swallow it. Okay. That's pretty simple. And so this lack of chewing stunted growth in our mouths and in our faces. And this really starts in infancy, breastfeeding versus bottle feeding. They've done tons of studies on this and found that bottle fed infants will have a much higher rate of snoring and sleep apnea because when you're breastfeeding, the mouth is forced, it takes a lot of stress on an infant. It forces the face out and by forcing the face out, widening the mouth, you get a wider airway. So without chewing, especially when we're young, things never develop properly. I'm a perfect example of that. I had extractions, braces, headgear, all of that. And the roof of my mouth goes up. And what it should be doing is coming down flat. And it comes down flat when you have that masticatory stress. So, so many of us, that's the reason why we have crooked teeth. And that's one of the main reasons why so many of us have breathing problems. So what about as an adults? Is there we're talking about the, the processed food, um, is, is eating natural, I mean, food, I guess, more in a natural state better than? I think um, by wide and large margins, it certainly is. <laughs> if you're talking about nutritionally, if you're talking about for the environment, and, and people seem to know that now, right? The word is out. Whole foods are better for you. Not a lot of argument about that. But no one's looking at how whole foods require you to chew more. So even what's considered healthy whole foods today, yogurt, avocados, smoothies, all this stuff is soft. And our ancestors used to chew for about four hours a day. You're chewing, if you're doing anything for four hours a day, if you're lifting weights for four hours a day, you're going to be huge. So just imagine what's that get, what that is going to do to your mouth. Our strongest muscle relative to its size and weight it's back here on our molars, 200 pounds of pressure. So it really likes to be exercised. And so few of us are exercising our mouths. You know, what's interesting to me is that in my early life, I was a speech pathologist. I never heard any of this. I'm fascinated by uh, so much of the, the research that you studied and brought together in this book. It's just uh, uh, amazing to me on so many levels. So the root of all evil, mouth breathing. <laughs> 
Uh, many people don't even think about it, but, but you say it's a very serious problem. Why is that? About 25 to 50% of the population, I learned this down at Stanford, uh, habitually breathes through its mouth. And I thought, who cares? I breathe through my mouth all the time. We have a mouth, we can breathe through it. What's the difference? And still a lot of people, including in the medical community, think that this is the same thing. The point is to get air in and your body's going to do the rest. It's completely false. I had had so many interviews with Dr. Jayakar Nayak down at Stanford. He's the chief of rhinology research, big nose guy. And he showed me if you cut a human head apart, and they took a CAT scan of me and showed me this, that the space, the volume of our sinuses would take up about the size of a billiard ball. So a little bit smaller than a tennis ball. So our sinuses extend here, they go up here, they start, everyone thinks this is the nose that goes straight to the throat. No, no, no. There is this huge structure in there and it forces air through this maze. And when air goes through that maze, it is heated, it is cleaned up, it is moistened and it's conditioned. So by the time it gets to your lungs, your lungs can absorb it so much more easily. So you say our air has to be moistened in there and if we're breathing through our mouth, that's just not taking place. You can just think of the, the nose as a filtration system. So the lungs in many ways, when you're breathing through the mouth, are exposed to everything in your environment. If you live in a city like I do, that means pollution, that means allergens, that means whatever. So the nose allows us to take in air and to essentially purify it, just like any filter, like a Brita water filter, but it's natural. And this is how we need to be breathing because also, the nose increases pressure. It's harder to breathe through the nose. People are like, why do I want to breathe through my nose? I can get air quicker through my mouth. True, but you want that pressure. You want that resistance because just breathing through the nose will allow you to get 20% more oxygen per breath than equivalent breaths to the mouth. And if you think that's not going to make a difference to you night and day, you're, you're nuts. It makes a huge difference. I love hearing I, I most of the time I have been listening to your book while I'm painting working on different things I have art studio I'm listening to you, you've been in the car with me you've been all kinds of places with me but the thing is is that um I want you to talk about the experiment that you that you were part of 10 days I, I mean I was I was wanting to gasp for air while you were t while you were reading it so tell us about that because that is such a fascinating thing that you did so as I was having these conversations with Jack or Nyack down, down at Stanford, who, who runs the shop down there in rhinology, I said, well, you know all the damage that happens breathing through the mouth. That's known. It's not very controversial. Everyone knows it now. But no one knew really how quickly that damage came on. No one had tested it. And I asked him, I said, you're at Stanford. Like, you can run this test. You're doing 20 other tests every year. And he thought it would be unethical. So he thought because everything that, that he knew about mouth breathing. And I said, well, what if I volunteered? And what if I found someone else to just do an experiment? And he said, okay, I'll, I'll do that. So the, the plan of the experiment, and I know this sounds like some jackass stunt or some supersize me thing, but it's not if you consider 25 to 50% of the population is breathing like this all the time. We were just lulling ourselves into a position so many people already knew. The difference was we were calculating it. We were measuring it. We had data. So we plugged our noses with silicon for 10 days and had a lab set up down here, the bottom floor of my, my house, where we were checking physiological markers three times a day. And then for the other 10 days, we were just nasal breathing. So at night, we put a little piece of tape on our mouths. Throughout the day, we just focused on taking longer breaths and breathing through the nose. And we thought that there would be some difference because I had read the research on this, but nobody had any idea it would be so profound and so sudden. So what were the findings? The main finding, I mean, there were several, but, but the most dramatic one was in regards to sleeping. So I did not snore before this experiment. Um, I, I think the last recording, the night before the experiment, I was snoring for four minutes. The night before that, zero minutes. So, so extremely minimal. That first night, so within about eight hours of getting plugged up, I was snoring through an hour and a half. I said, wow, that's, that's interesting. Next night, snoring even more. 
Within three nights, I was snoring four hours throughout the night. Not only that, I started choking on myself throughout the night, suffering from sleep apnea. Sleep apnea is different from snoring. It's when the tongue falls back into the airway and you... <sighs> and a quarter of the population has this. So the other subject in the experiment had the exact same thing happen to us. So beyond that, um, our nervous system were, were a complete mess through heart rate variability was a disaster. CO2 was a disaster. Stress levels were a disaster. Anxiety, more subjective markers. Athletic performance was a disaster. I mean, we felt awful, um, so completely fatigued, and the science supported everything that we were feeling. So this wasn't psychosomatic. We could clearly see it on all the machines we were using. So what physically did they find when they, let's just say when they unplugged? When they unplugged me, uh, there were uh, bacteria in my nose. I was getting chronic sinusitis, which is one of the reasons why people, they call it chronic sinusitis, because people with chronic sinusitis just keep getting it. And they found that so many of these people, their nasal passages aren't very well open because they don't breathe through their nose all the time. Not everyone, but for a large percentage of that population. And so you can think about like running water. It's hard for things to grow in running water. Still water, a whole bunch of stuff's gonna be growing in that. So beyond that, they did blood work. We did pulmonary function tests. And uh, we were in a state of extreme stress, of, of extreme adrenaline, stress hormone stress throughout that time. My blood pressure shot up 20 points with, within 20 points within 20 20 points. 20 points. And the day I took those out, my blood pressure shot down about 15 points, then leveled out. Overall, I think it had dropped about 12 points overall by switching the pathway through which we breathe. So when people say doesn't matter, nose or mouth, look at the science and if you're, if you're really curious, try it for yourself and see how that works out for you. So you had someone who was also doing this study with you. Did, did they have the same blood pressure type results? Was he had very low blood pressure going in. He oh, was in okay. an extreme uh, stress state. His blood pressure did go up a little bit. I have borderline higher blood pressure and mine shot through the roof. I mean, one measurement was, was 168. And then when I was done with the whole thing, uh, two days after I was done and I was continuing to breathe through my nose, it had gone down about 35 points, 35 points from wow. its highest. You talk about these different, how about you? I mean, just let's just focus for a second on your cognitive. How, how did you feel about, how was your thinking during this time? I and mean, did you see, notice a, a difference in, in just your processing? Absolutely. We were taking cognitive scores uh, twice a day. And I, we have all that data. To me, I've noticed that people... When it's something personal, when it's happening in your own body, they say, oh, that's just ham. That's not the same for everyone. So we really stuck with blood pressure measurements, which are not subjective. <laughs> CO2, right. O2, stress levels. Um, but on a, on a personal note, it was awful. I mean, it was really, we knew it was gonna like not be the funnest week and a half of our lives. We, we knew that, but we we're kind of joking about it. We're like, yeah, this is gonna suck, but we'll see what happens. But after listening to the recordings of it, we recorded everything, our sleep at night. After a while, I was getting so scared. I mean, instead of these, these charming like snores of, of some Dickensian drunk, it just sounded like people getting strangled to death, which was exactly what was happening. We were getting strangled to death on our own bodies. And a lot of that has to do with that. Without that pressure, those soft tissues at the back of the throat will tend to come forward. Okay, so breathing through the nose will help tone the airway in that way. When you're breathing through the mouth all night, I mean, not only are you snoring sleep apnea, but it's causing a bunch of other problems as well. So let's talk about that toning. What all do we, what are the benefits? I mean, the, the physical benefits are the opposite of what happened those 10 days that happen every time we breathe through our nose. So we've got this big muscle tube, it's called our throat, and it responds just like other muscles in our bodies. So when we're mashing up food like this and swallowing it and drinking gogurt or whatever we're eating you know we're not we don't have that masticatory stress 
And without that stress, this muscle becomes flaccid, just like any other muscle would, and especially the soft tissues at the back of the throat. And you can so easily see this when they've, they've done CAT scans and, and x-rays of people and these, these films, watching them breathe through their nose, the airway expands, watching them breathe through their mouth, the airway contracts. And even right now, if you open your mouth, you're going to feel your tongue gently falling back to your throat, okay? Mm -hmm. That makes for a smaller space to breathe air. If you close your mouth, the tongue will gently go up to the upper palate. Guess what happens? That airway is open. So Stanford is now doing a study with, uh, they're just booting up a study with 200 people looking at the difference between mouth breathing and nasal breathing and snoring and sleep apnea. So this is, this is real stuff. And you can go online and there's a zillion products, chin straps and tapes and all these different things. I can't speak to those, but I can speak to the benefits of nasal breathing at night, for sure. Well, tell us about um, nasal breathing in exercise. So a lot of people think that athletes are the fittest people on the planet, right? They're superhuman, they can do anything. Especially you see these weightlifter guys, they're all tanned and oiled up and they're flexing. You say, no one can be healthier than, than these people. But what so often happens is these people eat right, they exercise right, but they aren't breathing right. And weightlifters suffer from heart disease and chronic problems because they have so many muscles around their throat that they suffer from sleep apnea, which is why you're often going to see a weightlifter. They're going to be all built up here, but when their neck is out, it's going to be out like this. So wow. guess what happens when CPR, the first thing someone, a, a, a technician does, when someone passes out, they put their hand in the back of your neck and they open up your throat. So many of us are walking around like this nowadays because that's how we can open up our airways. So for athletics, it's, it's interesting because this is a population of people they're easy to study because they show up every single day. They adhere to the program. And reading these studies was mind-blowing how Dr. John Duyard, for 20 years he's still doing it, has been studying um, cyclists and rowers and looking what happens when he switches them from breathing through the mouth to breathing through the nose. And what, there's many details on this, but, but the, the nut of this is that by breathing through the nose, you are going to be able to do more while exerting less effort. And in endurance, that's exactly what you want. If you're able to run at a certain speed and have your heart rate lower and be burning oxygen more efficiently, that means you can run even faster and even longer and recover quicker. So this nasal breathing, bringing more oxygen to your body allows you to stay in that aerobic zone longer and not go into that anaerobic zone. And for any athlete, they know how important that is. Wow. That's, it's just, that's just, I still get fascinated and kind of blown away by all this. Um, what about, you also said that, that if we are breathing correctly, we can reduce the risk of COVID and other infectious diseases. Um, how so? That wouldn't be, I wouldn't use those words, but I will quote Dr. Ignaro, um, who won the Nobel Prize in the 90s for studying nitric oxide. So another one of the wonders of the nose here, I left this out, but I'm glad you brought it up is we produce this amazing molecule called nitric oxide, and we produce a huge perfusion of it in our noses. So just breathing through the nose, you will get six times more nitric oxide than breathing wow. through the mouth. And it so happens to be that nitric oxide is the molecule that is activated when people take Viagra because it is a wonderful vasodilator. So we can make our own nitric oxide right here. And it's also no coincidence that I think there's 14 studies right now where they're giving nitric oxide to COVID patients because it's so effective at opening the lungs and helping with gas exchange. So one of the other benefits of nitric oxide, the last one I'll, I'll mention here, is it interacts directly with pathogens, with bacteria and viruses. And there's been some, Ignaro has said he believes that breathing through the nose because it filters gunk and it also releases more nitric oxide can not only help us stave off severe symptoms of COVID, but may be able to protect us. I don't want to say that. I don't want angry right. people when I say I breathe through my nose, I still got COVID. But, right. but check out Louis Ignaro and, and his work and it's pretty convincing. Let's talk about carbon dioxide. 
Uh, I found this very uh, interesting as well. You say that people do not have enough CO2, but one would think that we're trying to get rid of CO2 when we breathe. So why do we need carbon dioxide? CO2 has gotten this very bad rap lately for good reason. There's way too much of it in the atmosphere. There's more entering the atmosphere. It's been implicated in climate change, acidity of the ocean and all that. But when we're talking about our bodies, what our bodies want is a balance of CO2 and oxygen. So a lot of people think in, in yoga classes and exercise classes, I've had instructors say, you know, breathe more, get all that CO2 out. No, that is not what you should be doing. In those cases, you should often be breathing less because without a proper amount of CO2 in your body, it takes oxygen longer. It's harder for oxygen to disassociate. That's the term they use into tissues and muscles and organs. So CO2 is like this go-between that oxygen will go to areas where there is CO2 and that's what helps exchange it from hemoglobin to, to cells. I won't get all into that, um, but you can try a little experiment right now. You can breathe some heavy breaths through the mouth, that's fine. Breathe about 10 heavy breaths. And after a while, you're gonna start to feel some tingling or maybe some numbness in your fingers or toes. You're gonna get a little dizzy in your head. That is what it feels like to not have enough CO2 in your body. And what is happening is without that CO2, you are getting vasoconstriction. You are constricting blood circulation to these areas. You need CO2 to open up these blood vessels. So that is why it's so important to have that balance. And that's also why a lot of people with asthma, anxiety, and other problems Traditionally, how they're like, I'm always cold, my fingers are cold, my hands are cold. By slowing your breath and allowing those CO2 levels to come up, you can use circulation to help heat yourself. Okay, now that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that, that's interesting. Okay, so at this point in time, I'd like to see, let's go through one breath exercise then that you find interesting or helpful. I'm going to have to give you the disclaimer now. Yeah, we got disclaimers are good. Not, not a doctor, not a breathing therapist. I'm a science journalist who went into this world to write and learn from all these people. Having said that, I was able to pick up a few tricks along the way that I use all the time. Um, but I don't often do this, but this is such an easy practice. I'll give you a little preamble of, of okay. how this is going to work in your body so maybe you can feel it. Actually, we'll start breathing, and as you're breathing, I'll explain what's happening. So okay. this is the easiest thing to do in the world. It's so easy that a lot of people think, oh, that's not gonna do anything for me. But uh, look at the science and you'll find otherwise. So breathe in to a count of about five or six. Don't worry if you're a second off. Three, four, five, six. And exhale to that same count. Three, four, five, six. Inhale, two, three, four, five, six. Exhale, two. So just keep doing that. Um, I'll keep clapping here like I'm at a concert. Um, so as you're doing that, something amazing is happening in your body is by breathing this slowly, you are absorbing more oxygen, but you're also keeping more CO2. So there's more oxygen entering your brain and if you put your hand over your heart when you're exhaling, you're gonna feel your heart rate lower. So Dr. Patricia Gerbarg and Richard Brown, he's at Columbia, have found that just having people breathe like this, even for a few minutes a day, is fantastic for blood pressure. They use it for their patients with anxiety and depression and other fear-based disorders. So I have found that I can breathe like this for about two minutes, I can take my blood pressure before, I can breathe like this two minutes later, I can see uh, my blood pressure go down about 10 to 15 points. People say, that's impossible, try it out. Let me know how that works for you. <laughs> so breathing is this, if you're still breathing that way, you can continue, but we're gonna slightly change it up here. Start okay. to breathe to, to a rate of about just try this one. Inhale to about three and exhale to about eight. If eight is too long, cut it to six. That's fine. As long as the exhale is longer than the inhale. So when you do this, again, you can feel your heart rate. Uh, you can feel it on your wrist too, if that's easier, your neck, whatever. So 
inhaling to three, and as you exhale, you feel your heart rate going down. You inhale again, and your heart rate's going to softly just drift off, go down. So this isn't a placebo effect, and it's not psychosomatic. What's happening when you're exhaling longer, you are touching into that autonomic nervous system, which is supposed to be automatic. It's not, we can take control of it, and you're taking control of it right now when you're breathing. So by exhaling longer, you are putting yourself more into a relaxed and restful state, what's known as the parasympathetic side of the nervous system. And this is very clear to see if you put sensors on and look at heart rate variability. So throughout the day, if you want more energy, inhale more than you're exhaling, and that's going to give you a stimulating effect. If you want to calm down, if you're stressed out before you're going to bed, double the amount of time it takes you to inhale. And breathing, you can just think of this as these different levers that we can turn on and off. And there's 500 different ways, pranayama, Chinese, Qigong, whatever, but they're all doing the same thing. They're allowing you to calmly access functions in your body through the breath. Okay. And I'm sitting here thinking, well, next time I have white coat syndrome, there's a really good... <laughs> So you will be, especially for that, you will be amazed how quickly that works. Take a couple minutes before you, you go into the doctor's office and there's a very good chance your blood pressure is going to be a lot lower than it would have been otherwise. You know, it's interesting because that is one of those things that, that makes so much sense because usually you're in a rush. We're almost always late to that appointment, right? And, and so we walk in there and the first thing they do is take your blood pressure. <laughs> and in, your, in the afternoon, your blood pressure is going to be higher than it is in the morning, too. So that needs to be considered as, as well. But what, what's great about this stuff is, you know, some people say, oh, it's new agey, it's woo-woo. It's all measurable. And if something can be measured, it can be studied. And if it can be studied, it can be proven right or wrong. What's so great is breath is so easy to measure. Even with stuff you have around the house, if you have a blood pressure monitor, pulse oximeter, heart rate variability on a lot of Apple watches, you can see this transformation happening in your body after a couple minutes. Just imagine what will happen after a couple of days or a couple of weeks. It can really transform your health. I've, I've seen I it. People, yeah, I hope people try it. Let's, let's go back to breathing and how it impacts sleep if we can. Um, you talked about uh, sleep apnea, and and but you've also said that people can improve it naturally. How, how can they improve apnea and those things naturally? So a friend of mine, he's a really fit dude. He's a swimmer. He's an athlete, eats the right things, strong guy. He's had two or three sleep studies. He has moderate to severe sleep apnea and he's done everything. He's like, why is this happening to me? You know, I exercise, I do the right stuff. I still have sleep apnea. So just as an experiment, I never wrote about this, um, but as an experiment, I said, I want you to do two things. I gave him a pulse oximeter that he could wear at night that would record his sleep apnea throughout the night. And we looked at data. I said, the first thing you're gonna do, and I have a little roll of tape here, is put a teeny piece of tape. This is not a hostage situation. This isn't like some scary Pulp Fiction stuff. This is a teeny, teeny piece of tape right here doesn't matter if you have a beard, a mustache, whatever. I can still talk. I can breathe if I want. The point is to just train the mouth shut at night. And then I said, why don't the back of your bed, a lot of us are lying too flat. Lift the back of your bed up six inches. This is called incline bed therapy. He went from having moderate to sometimes severe sleep apnea to zero apnea events by doing this. Zero. And I've heard this from dozens and dozens and dozens of people who are writing me. I'm not going to say this is going to work for everyone. I'm not prescribing right. this to get off your medication, go and do this. I'm saying these things are free. They're available to everybody. And just the position of your body, because if you think about it, I told you all the things about the throat, right? If your tongue is apt to fall back into your airway, guess what happens when gravity gets involved? It gets so much worse. So by bringing yourself up and by closing your mouth, you can have a very dramatic effect on both these things. Four out of five of my friends have stopped their snoring by using that little piece of tape and their spouses have come to me. They're like, when can I buy you 
a beer. <laughs> uh, again, I don't write about this because it's not an official study. This is stuff that I did. I was curious and I've recorded all the data myself and they were blown away and other people are too. What do you have to lose? Nothing. There we go. Right. Okay. So I will tell you another thing that I just kind of um, nerded out on. And this is like the thing. Okay, James, the pituitary. Okay. You talk about how the pituitary is affected with poor breathing during sleep. Let's talk about that because I think the science behind this one, I don't think the, the general public understands this or knows this. And I really, I mean, I don't not try to insult anybody, but it, tell us about that. It, it was fascinating to me. I was talking to Dr. Stephen Park of the Albert Einstein School of Medicine in New York, and he knows more about this than anyone. He's a surgeon, he's a scientist, he's a researcher. And he had told me when our sleep is disrupted, our body doesn't release this thing called ADH vasopressin. That's a fancy name for it. It's this hormone that allows us to store water. So why is it your dog can sleep for 10 hours and not have to pee? Why is it that when we're sleeping normally, we don't have to wake up three or four times to go to the bathroom? We need this to secrete at the right times. And this only secretes in stages of very deep sleep. If you are up all night, choking on yourself. So sleep apnea, what it does right as you're drifting off, <sighs> you wake up and your body is stressed out and your heart rate goes up because you think your, your unconscious brain thinks you're being attacked by a lion and you go back to sleep. <sighs> you're never falling into that state of very deep sleep. And again, you don't have to have medically diagnosed sleep apnea. You don't have to have snoring. Any resistance in the airway can cause this. And this is what Stephen Park has found. He found that women who wake up to, to relieve themselves more than two times a night have, are twice as likely to die of all causes because it's tied to this deep sleep. In these stages of deep sleep, your brain is just dumping toxins out and you need to enter that state for this to happen. Matthew Walker wrote a great book called Why We Sleep which gets into this as well. And this was, it's no coincidence that during that Stanford study, and um, this was even before I learned about this stuff, I was waking up like two or three times a night. I was like, what is going on here? And I was like, okay, no water before bed, two hours before. I was still waking up. And I said, I thought my body was broken. And it essentially was this, it needed this vasopressin to do what it does. And it wasn't getting it because of, all of these breath related problems with sleep. Now you said too, if, and correct me if I'm wrong, but that also this, that, that this chemical that you're talking about, this hormone, it also, it has a diuretic effect, but if you're reducing your water ahead of time and then you have, I mean, are you, are you having less water in your system then? Is it, is it, is it a, an evil, you know, spin around here that we're... No, it allows your body to absorb and store that water. And I believe that storage is within the kidneys. But if you so. don't, aren't going into that, and you're relieving yourself and urinating all night long, what's happening to the body then? Are you getting less water in your system then if you're if it's not being released? You are, if, if you don't have that hormone within your body, the, your, your, your body is not able to signal to store that water. So it's trying to just offload it all the time, which is wow. exactly the reason why people get up three or four times a night to, to go to and the restroom. Dehydrated. And they're feeling dehydrated as well. Absolutely. You wake up here. I mean, that's another thing with, with mouth breathing. I thought this was normal for decades. I'd go to sleep with this huge jug of water and throughout the night, I would just hit it saying, this is what everyone does. It's not normal. Check out a horse when it's when it's sleeping, check out a dog. If you have a bulldog, that's different because they've got some facial problems, but check out any animal in the wild and, and they don't do this. And, and here we are, humans, modern humans are doing this all the time. It's also related to, to cavities and periodontal disease. When you keep your mouth open that much, create an acidic environment. And Dr. Mark Berheny said, this is the number one reason why people are getting cavities. It's not sugar, wow. it's mouth breathing. That's his words, not mine, but blew me away. Wow. And also children who wet the bed, this, right? There are direct correlations between bedwetting and sleep apnea. And 
childhood sleep apnea now is such an enormous problem. They've found that ADHD, some researchers have told me ADHD does not exist. What it is, is sleep apnea. You get rid of the sleep apnea, you get rid of the resistance in the airway, and wow, these kids no longer have problems. Instead of putting them on a cocktail of different prescription drugs, take care of their breathing problems first and foremost. And again, Stephen Park has done so much work in this area. So has uh, Christian Guillemont down at Stanford, has shown very clear correlations between bedwetting, ADHD, other neurological issues, and poor sleep. Ah, parents pay attention. I mean, I wish I was that child and my parents never knew why and I never knew why. And I was always tired and I didn't know why. You know, I mean, and I was super high grades. I had all those things. I wasn't initially hyperactive in school, but I did have the other. And I know that the exhaustion, I look back and I think, wow. You know, I told my mother the other day about this. I said, hey, mom, guess what? Guess who I'm interviewing? You need to hear this. You know, things you didn't, we didn't know when I was a kid, right? And uh, what a benefit it would have been to have known what was really going on, right? And I'm, I'm surprised that it's still not talked about. It's not, that, that's starting to really change in some big ways with all of these studies and all this awareness right now. And, and I, I think in 10 years from now, we're going to say, what have we been doing, you know? Oh, absolutely. So let's just change over real quickly. How does breathing uh, relate to meditation and prayer? So about 20 years ago, some Italian researchers were looking at different prayers. They were looking at Om Mani Padmi Hum, which is a Buddhist mantra. They were looking at the rosary in the original Latin because they were Italian. They were looking at all these different prayers and found that they required the same amount of time to recite. So about five to six seconds, I say 5.5. I think it was actually 5.6, but we're, we're rounding down, right? So, and they found that when people recited these prayers, and even when people just breathed at this rate, 5.5 in, 5.5 out, which is exactly what we were just doing a couple minutes ago, all those wonderful things were happening to the body. The systems of the body entered this state of coherence where everything was working all in line with one another. And if you look, it's fascinating to look at these data sheets. And when these people were talking, the lines were all over the place of their nervous system. When they started breathing this way, it was these beautiful sine waves because the body's just like, ah, oh, this is where I want to be. So the Italian researchers said that they believe this was likely why these prayers have been practiced for so long. They don't want to take away the religious message, right. but it made people more, I uh, opened them up to the healing message of prayer. And it's no coincidence why well, you can go across several different cultures and they all had prayers locked into the same respiration rate. That's, that's uh, fascinating as well. I have, you related a funny story that also has to do somewhat with culture um, and the way cultures look at breathing. And that was your, uh, friend of yours who ran up to you when you had your nose plugged <laughs> and, and he told you a story about how his culture thought about mouth breathing. Do you know what I'm talking about? Um, and you said that he hit himself on the back of the head to tell you about what his teachers oh. used to do. <laughs> and I, I think it's so interesting, James, because we don't teach our kids these things. And so tell the, tell the audience what happened. Uh, Antonio, I've known him forever. And he's seen me do all kinds of weirdo research because <laughs> that's what I do as a science journalist. But he was so shy. I think a little bit of his respect for me went out the window. I came out with pink earplug, you know, in my nose. He's like, what are you doing? And he grew up in Mexico, in, in Puebla, and said that you could not open your mouth in school, at home. I mean, unless you were talking, you had to sit there and constantly close your mouth. But this had been known and celebrated in every Native American culture. We, we know that as well. You know, stand up straight and close your mouth. Still good advice, you know, and, and, and this dates back thousands of years. Uh, in the Chinese Tao, there's six or seven books dedicated to, entirely to breathing. And they said that breathing through the mouth will cause the body injury and you will die. Breathing through the nose will benefit the body. So it was, it was so clearly written, literally etched in stone 1500 years ago. And yet 
here we are as a culture, just walk, everyone's walking around. I mean, you just see it all over the place. You know, and it's interesting too, because at, at being a former teacher, I could, I could see a parent coming up to see me, Hey, what are you doing? Correcting my kids breathing, you know, now, but, but to think about it, that that really is such a wise thing to teach our kids. And, and, and yet we've lost it somehow in our culture. And that's what so many, I was just talking to a doctor in the UK yesterday is this is the first thing he does. So before prescribing different diets, before prescribing exercise, um, even before, and this is what, what he does, not, not what I would do, just to be clear, before prescribing them on various medications, he has them fix their breathing. If they choose not to, if they say, oh, I don't want to do that, you know, I want the pill, that's cool because Western medicine is absolutely amazing what it can do for us. But I believe that people should at least be given a choice. So when you go into a doctor's office, at least you can, you know, you can continue with your current treatment, but there is something else here that can benefit you, doesn't take a lot of time, doesn't take a lot of effort. We know it works and here it is. Why not explore it? That's so good. So good. Okay. Do you have time for a couple of audience questions? I do. Of course. Okay. All right. So it says, uh, let's hear, we got number, number one, people like Dr. Weil teach uh, breathing in the nose, holding breath and out the mouth. What does that achieve? So this is something that I've received several emails from people, uh, you know, saying, oh my God, I exhaled through my mouth today. What, what's going to happen to me? And I said, oh my God, I've, I've created some monsters here. Just to be perfectly clear with everybody, when you are practicing an exercise, when you are consciously breathing, you can breathe through your mouth. You can exhale through your mouth. That's completely fine. What I was trying to make very clear in the book is I'm talking about habitual chronic breathing. So that you want to be doing in and out of your nose. So these exercises, and I know the one that wild is four, seven, eight. So inhale to four, hold for seven to eight, right? Mm -hmm. Guess why you're going like this? You are creating resistance and you are allowing your lungs to absorb more oxygen. Okay. Um, But doing that is perfectly fine. For chronic exhales, you should be exhaling through your nose because as the nose conditions air coming in, it also traps that moisture and that pressure coming out so you don't get as thirsty. If you're breathing through your mouth, if you're exhaling through your mouth, you are going to lose 40% more water, which is why you see these people jogging. Now they have these belts with seven different water bottles and stuff, and they're you close your mouth you don't need that belt like we're, we're designed to hold in that moisture because all that air has to go back through that maze in the sinuses to come back out so for habitual breathing nasal exhales have a very profound and and, and clear benefit so you actually just answered the second question which was when we exercise say running should we only breathe in and out of the nose we should. There's some elite athletes who have gotten so good at breathing um, can inhale through the nose and exhale through the mouth. A lot of cyclists do that. I don't have a big problem with that because they're doing this at, at states of extreme stress. And if you're doing this to win a competition, go for it. But again, I was talking about habitual breathing. We know wow. the benefits to nasal breathing and athletic performance are profound. It's going to be hard for people. I'm getting emails from people saying, hey, I try to do this. I'm jogging. This doesn't work. This is stupid advice, you know, whatever. So sometimes things take a couple of weeks or a couple of months to, to break a habit. So if you stick with it, the benefits are, are known. Oh, James, thank you so much. I appreciate you being here today. I appreciate your book and, and the research work that you do, bringing it all together. If Okay, audience, this is the book. Okay. All right. So, uh, breath and I recommend it I you know get it get it listen to your car I mean it just listen to it it just um, there's so much research that you've brought together into one place and it really really is helpful Uh, where can people find you Uh, my website mrjamesnester.com has all the scientific references it also has breathing practices all for free by doctors and researchers in the field I'm also trying to get better at the social media thing. I'm a bit of a dinosaur, but I'm on Instagram under Mr. James Nestor and Facebook as well. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much. Lovely to have met you. And thank you so much for the work you do. Thank you very much for having me.